Hi, I'm Jennifer Finney Boylan, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret White. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Jennifer Finney Boylan. Before we get into our great interview today, I'd like to tell you about some sponsors. Crystal Pico Watanabe at Pico's House is one of the very best editors I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. Crystal offers developmental editing, line editing, and beta reading. Uh, She's booking for March right now, so inquire early. Go ahead and send her uh, an email. She has four proofreaders on staff, uh, so she can usually accommodate authors with a much shorter lead time. Uh, She comes highly recommended by authors such as Hugh Howie and Samuel Peralta and must... Most of her experiences with science fiction, speculative fiction, and middle grade fantasy, but uh, you know, she's a master of all, so uh, be sure to reach out to her. Also, she's got something cool uh, that she's doing now. She's uh, uh, currently recruiting for her Net Galley Co op. Uh, authors who have new book releases or have old books that could use some review love can rent one, six, or 12 month slots and put up to a book a month on NetGalley's catalog, which now has its own dedicated United Kingdom site. So uh, check out the link in the show notes uh, to Pico's house. There's an awesome new anthology out from my friend Armand Rosamilia. It's called My Favorite Story Podcast Author Anthology. Project Entertainment Network presents My Favorite Story. Fifteen podcast hosts and authors share their favorite short stories they've ever written. Stories by Christopher Golden, Brian King, James A. Moore, Jay Wilburn, Chuck Buddha. Armand Rosamelia and more. Check out this collection of stories presented by podcast hosts and authors. You're going to love this. There's a link to it in the show notes. Also, check out my friend Daniel Kenny, who writes some of the very best middle grade uh, fiction. Uh, if you're looking for the perfect gift for those younger readers, Dan is he's an amazing writer. Uh, he's been on the show before, and uh, he's hilarious. And he writes books that really grab kids' attention. Uh, he, I can't say enough wonderful things about Dan Kinney. There's a link down in the show notes. We're going to be talking more specifically about some of his books in the coming shows, but you're going to love Daniel Kinney. Go pick up some of his uh, middle grade readers for those uh, youngsters in your life. Also, Patricia Gilliam, she's one of my favorite science fiction writers. Uh, Patricia does amazing things. Um, There's a link down in the show notes where you can go visit her author page. She has a long-running series. If you're looking to get into some great new science fiction reading in the new year, you cannot go wrong with picking up some from Patricia Gilliam. As always, we have an audiobook clip at the end of the show from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Thanks for listening. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Jennifer Boylan on the show, and uh, she has a new uh, book that's out in paperback now called Long Black Veil, and uh, I've been reading it, and it's uh, it's a great, great read. I can't wait for all of you to pick it up. Um, Welcome to the show, Jennifer. Hi, Hank. Um, Jennifer, I begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Wow. Um, it's funny because I think that goes back so far that I, I, I don't even remember a time when I didn't want to be a storyteller. Um, I was certainly um, the class clown in elementary school, uh, and – love to uh, entertain uh, my fellow students. Um, I, you know, I just kind of had a constant um, monologue going. Um, I think at least, at least that was after a certain age. And I think it may be because I was transgender that I um, couldn't, there's a certain point at which I couldn't focus in school. I couldn't concentrate. And so I turned to, um, comedy uh, as a way of distracting not only myself but everybody else. 
So my desire to um, to tell stories and to uh, you know to entertain, I think, goes back pretty deep. Yeah, I, I think that's a uh, a common experience for for uh, kids that feel like outsiders. Uh, maybe you know, I had dyslexia uh, and was you know a chubby kid, and you know the the natural. Um, kind of, uh, you know, defense mechanism is to try to make people laugh, to, to, to make them like you in some way. And uh, I think but a isn't lot that of... amazing if you think about it, that um, uh, there, there really are two reactions to um, feeling uh, different and feeling on the outside. And one of them is to sink into a, a, you know, a lifelong depression. But the other is to uh, go to the place of comedy. Um, and it, it is just um, uh, interesting to me that um, y- y- you know if you, y- it's it's not if you scratch the surface of any comic writer or comic performer for that matter, you don't have to go too deep before you find somebody who's trying to process some pretty dark material. It's, it's one reason why when when I first started writing, um, what you know when I first started publishing novels back in the nineties. Uh, some of the reaction to uh, some of the, some of the critical reaction to some of those works was, you know, well, uh, it seems so strange that these uh, characters are responding to the uh, terrible things going on around them with uh, buoyancy and light. Um, and I was just thinking, well, how else would you respond to darkness? I mean, what would you do? Sit around crying? <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, Com- comedy and despair are, are really close cousins. Yeah, and I, it's, I mean, I think there, there there are some people who don't speak the language of comedy, uh, or maybe it's just the kind of comedy that is uh, abundant in our culture now is stupid comedy. It's the comedy of cruelty or the comedy of you know fart fart jokes, and uh, you know kind of. You know the, the comedy of, of of middle school. Not not that I'm I'm I have anything against middle school, but the idea that I mean, think of it. When was the last time a comic film won Best Picture? Uh, the last time that that a, that a, a a a film that was you know billed as a comedy won Best Picture. It would be Annie Hall back in 1976. Because when it's time, when it's time for you know us to take our measure of our of our of our um, our worth as creators of serious art, for some reason, well, for all, all the obvious reasons, comedy and humor is considered somehow less less serious than the serious, which I think everybody with half a brain knows that it's not. Right. Well, and I think it goes to to what you were just saying that uh, our. Uh, so much of the the comedy that we encounter now is is going for the cheap laugh instead of the um, the 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 deep cutting laugh. Uh, you know that it's so easy to go with a uh, you know with a scatological joke or with snark uh, when when the, the true response could be so much deeper. There's a um, there's a line in my memoir. She's not there, in which I describe a trip I took to Canada where um, it, uh, I, uh, among my other things on my to-do list was possibly to take my own life when I was a young person in my 20s because I just couldn't solve the transgender thing. It just seemed impossible to me. Um, and there's a, there's a scene where I'm, uh, I'm staying in a motel in a little kind of uh, off-season village way up in the northern part of Nova Scotia. And I say something like, uh, I got the idea that I could just start over again in this little town as a woman. I could tell everyone I was Canadian. Then I lay on my back and sobbed. Nobody would ever believe I was Canadian. (laughs) Ha, ha, ha. So I I tell you that line not only to show off uh, an interesting joke, but also to me that line – Nobody would would believe I was Canadian is a line that on the surface of it is a joke. Ha ha ha. Because you think what I'm going to say is nobody would believe I was a woman. 
so it has that little surprise at the end. On the other hand, it, that line, uh, in, in a nutshell, masks uh, a tremendous sorrow and a tremendous sense of never being able to belong to the world. So what I what I I, I love lines like that where comedy and 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 tragedy or horror um, are really just two sides of the same face. Um, and uh, to me, that that's a I mean, there aren't there aren't a lot of, of writers who do that. I think George S- Sanders um, is wonderful at that. Um, I think uh, Jennifer Egan uh, is great at that. Uh, Richard Russo. My friend Rick, Rick Russo is uh, is wonderful at that, but it's it's uh, I don't know I still think sometimes that we're outliers in, uh, in 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 the world of serious literary fiction. Sure, sure. Um, well, let, let's go back just a little bit. Um, when you were uh, you said you you don't remember a time that you were not a storyteller and um, the the class clown and and always looking. Um, to engage people and, and things like that. But did you, uh, did you pursue writing as a career, uh, like when you went to college and, and started making your, your career way in life? I think at college I didn't know what I, I wanted to do because I wasn't sure who I wanted to be. Uh, but I, I did wind up um, writing for and eventually being the editor-in-chief of the newspaper at Wesleyan University. Uh, and uh, I, I got there not only by being a reporter but also by being a columnist uh and i i, I really i found something uh in my you know really my late teens early 20s in in, in the voice of writing columns because it was essentially a first person monologue in which i was but it wasn't stand up uh it was something more literary than stand up and something a little more um if less dangerous, if less of a high wire act than stand up, it was certainly still a way of um, creating uh, a, 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 a standalone piece that would be both comic and uh, unsettling. Uh, so that was really the first the first success that I had. I did study writing at Wesleyan. Uh, uh, I wrote <laughs> I my my first my first public public piece of art was a um an ongoing radio serial uh on wesu fm in middletown connecticut which was called the squid family it was an ongoing uh soap opera surreal soap opera about a family of squids you know it's kind of what you'd expect (laughs) anyway i did that i got out of wesleyan and i moved to new york city because i figured that's where you went in the early 80s if you wanted to be a writer uh and a lot of the you know i i'd left wesleyan pretty confident and pretty sure that if i were going to be able to survive in the world i could do it by being entertaining and you know moved to new york city in order to make that reality and very quickly my little boat crashed upon rocks and found that you know that this was much scarier and harder than i thought and uh, you know nobody was particularly holding their breath for my curious little season poems and uh eventually i started writing novels and i got in new york city for five years um had some day jobs at publishers including viking penguin ep dutton uh, i worked at a magazine called american bystander which was uh supposed to be an american version of punch which was founded by the original cast of saturday night live and some writers and cartoonists from the new yorker uh, but that went belly up also. <laughs> so by the time I was in my mid twenties, I um, just decided to start over, and I I entered uh, a grad program uh, in Baltimore uh, at Johns Hopkins, where I studied with uh, John Barth uh, and Edward Albee. And in a way, you know, I I, I had those early days in New York City trying to learn how to be a writer uh and um what i learned was how hard it is and um you know m- my friend russo says every author has a thousand pages of bad fiction in him or her and if you want to be a writer among the things you have to do is you just have to start writing out all your bad pages 
So I probably wrote about a thousand pages of, of bad fiction during the time that I lived in New York City. I wrote at least two, maybe three unpublishable novels. But just the experience of doing that taught me a lot. And it's funny, you think writers, uh, we somehow we expect writers to be able to sit down and punch out the great work, maybe because uh, language is so second nature to us. But you you would never expect uh, a musician to just sit down at the piano and immediately start playing, uh, you know, a, a brilliant original concerto. You would you would never expect um, an artist to be able to just walk up to an easel and start painting. Um, but we do expect um, novels and uh, short stories to just kind of land on the page from Mars. And um, what I learned then and now <laughs> is that it's hard work and that every day you got to practice. Absolutely. And, and you, you are not the first story that I've heard of someone who had, uh, you know, great dreams of, of writing the great American novel, going to New York because that's where you do it. And, and then, you know, wind up taking a day job working for a publisher and, you know, maybe editing or maybe, you know, working the slush pile and, and, and all of that uh, at, during that experience of, of kind of uh, getting into publishing not the way you expected to, um, did that change your ideas about writing uh, and about the the business of publishing uh, it during that time? It certainly made me understand that uh, you know what's that story? There's a story I think it's in Tolstoy where there's a writer who's just slaving away, and then one day I think a ship is it you know the story a ship pulls up and. Uh, a man comes on to the shore and goes up to the writer's cottage and says, that's it. You are the hope. You are the future of Mother Russia. That's that's kind of what I expected. I thought that I would just simply write the great work and then everyone would bow down. And um, it, understanding the commerce of uh, literary art um, did – I mean it was, it was sobering uh, – but I'm glad that I had that understanding. I mean, it's funny because once you start talking about commerce, it seems to um, – then we're talking about something other than art. Um, and writers who write for money or writers who try to make their art as commercial as possible are writers who are probably um, going to wind up crying some tears – because often it's just as hard to be successful with a piece of uh, literature that 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 sucks, <laughs> or it's it's just as hard to make make money when you sell out as it is when you write your incomprehensible Finnegan's Wake. So you might as well write the thing that's in your heart. Uh, that said, it's still important to know that there's not a boat that's going to come up and. A, a man's not going to jump off the boat and say you're the hope of of, of Mother America. Uh, that you you somehow have to find readers. And any any writer who says I don't care about readers is well, I mean, I, I there's I guess there's nothing wrong with that. But if, if anyone who says I'm really writing just for myself should probably keep their promise and not show their work to anybody, because once you once you engage with an with a with a reader. Now you're in a relationship and you have to be um, aware of what's going on in the reader's experience of your work. I mean, readers should not be expected to be mind readers. Uh, they shouldn't be expected to understand your complex genius in all of its insufferable detail. Uh, at the same time, you don't want to bend over too backwards. Wait, is that, a, is that even a phrase? I'm going to say that again. You don't want to bend over too backwards. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I I got the metaphor. I know yeah. exactly what you, you mean. You don't want yeah. to bend over too backwards. I'm, yeah. I'll just I'll just leave it right there. I can't improve on that. <laughs> well, you know, there's a um, 
if a if a writer doesn't have a certain amount of ego um, to believe that that uh, that he or she has something to say uh, and that people deserve to get to read my words, um, you know, then we'll never set out on the journey to to do that. And then, but but having that tempered with the understanding of commerce, the way you described it, I think is absolutely perfect um, uh, because you do have to be a you know a bit of a narcissist and, and think that that. You know that you you have something the world needs, uh, but then you also have to understand that that contract, that relationship that you make with the writer, and uh, and and getting all those pieces together at once makes for a great writer. Yeah, I think if you don't have a um, almost exaggerated sense of your own genius, you're not going to survive because there are so many good reasons to give up. I mean. To be a writer, in some ways, I mean, at least my my experience of being a writer is, you you should be working a little bit, and sometimes more than a little bit every day. And what else is going to compel you to get your ass in that chair, except a an unshakable belief that you have to have something that is unique and that um, you need to devote your life to. You know, because, you know, unless you're very, very lucky, uh, success is going to be elusive uh, at, at best. Um, and there are always more fun things to do than writing. I mean, every day there's a there's a there's a good reason not to do the work. Uh, so what with else? the Internet, there's lots of good reasons not to do the work. I mean, that's the thing. You sit down and now there are things that feel like writing, like blogging or answering your email or being on Facebook or being on Twitter, all of those things feel like writing and yet they're not writing. And you can spend, I, in fact, I spend an hour or two or more each day, uh, engaged in that kind of work because it kind of feels like writing except without doing any of the real work. And I forget who it is that said this. I just read this. It might be Alice Monroe. If you want to be a writer, First thing you do is get yourself a, a computer that is not connected to the internet. I'm not sure I believe that, by the way, because a lot of the work that I do requires that I do research, and uh, if I need to find who was uh, Ulysses S. Grant's vice president, uh, uh, you know, I'll go on there. The problem is, once you go on there, you're like, "Oh, Ulysses S. Grant, this is so interesting." Did you know that his wife Julia was cross-eyed? Only first lady who was cross-eyed, isn't it? Now, who else is cross-eyed who was famous? And and then an hour goes by, and now you're reading all about Clarence the cross-eyed lion who lived in Kenya. Uh, and you're Alice, and you've completely gone down the rabbit hole. Yeah. So that's why I think I think a certain. I mean, uh, a lot of writing I think is just showing up, getting your ass in the chair, and. Uh, for me, I, I have a quota, if I can, every day, um, a thousand words, 1,500 maybe, but um, at least a thousand words. And that holds true whether those are a thousand good words or more likely a thousand bad words. Uh, because it's it's harder to go from nothing to something than from something to something good. Um, and it's it's really revision, I think, that is the most important thing in writing. And it's also the hardest thing to learn. It's the hardest thing to sustain. It's the hardest thing to make yourself do because if you go back and see that your work needs to be improved, like it always does, there's a little death that you experience there. There's a way in which you're feeling, oh, I'm not really a writer after all because the thing that I wrote sucks. Well, actually, the reverse is true. Recognizing that your work needs a second and third and fifth and tenth draft is what makes us a writer. If you're, if you're anyone, I mean, I don't know anybody whose first drafts are magically good. I mean, maybe there's a few people who just kind of their work falls out of the sky, but you know, I don't know. Those aren't writers. Those are angels. Well, and, and, uh, because I've, I've talked to some people that, that, uh, on the surface, it looks like they write one draft and turn it in and it's just nearly perfect but the reality when you talk to them is that each day when they sit down to write they're going back and they're revising and they're revising the, the previous day's work and they may only turn out 200 new words a day um, because they're continually revising and it looks like a first draft but it's really about eight drafts yeah that, and that's that especially draft. that's especially true of writers of certainly um, 
comic or humorous prose, but any prose that has the feeling of effortlessness. As Stephen King's work, which is not exactly comedy, um, has a feeling of effortlessness to it. And one of the, the uh, complications for people writing the effortless prose is, it, you know, if it feels effortless, it feels like you didn't put any effort into it. And so the amount of work you have to put in to make something feel effortless uh, is um, is mind-boggling. It's actually, I think, harder to make something feel effortless than to make it feel belabored. Uh, and you read something like Finnegan's Wake or, oh, I don't know, uh, anything by David Foster Wallace, and you just you you just get the sense of someone having, you know, strangled themselves while writing that prose. Someone who's just 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 you know really really suffering as they're coming up with this complex piece of literary algebra. Um, and yet if you read, uh, well, Stephen King's a good example. If you read Stephen King, uh, or what, what's the, the, what's the word, a page turner, uh, Jody Picot, uh, you know, any, anybody whose work, and I think, I think critics sometimes belittle work that seems effortless. Uh, but I, you know, it's, the ideas shouldn't be effortless. Um, the the, uh, the 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 work itself is not effortless. The only thing that's effortless is um, the way it feels when you read it. Yeah. Um, so so you wrote your your thousand unpublishable pages and uh, <laughs> you know three novels or so. What was the the work that uh, uh, that that did get published and that that you realized? Okay, I've, I've crossed some sort of a threshold, and now uh, I, I understand the craft. <laughs> <laughs> Everything I've ever written is is the, the threshold where I think, oh, now I finally I got it. Finally, right. I got it. until you get the notes back from your editor, and you're yeah. like, oh, well, never mind. I, well, <laughs> I think, I mean, the hardest thing for me as a young writer was that I was transgender, um, but I wasn't out. I was seeking for a way for that hard truth not to be true. It's so different now. I think people are much less um, afraid of being trans publicly. I think people are more familiar with being with what it means. You know, when I was in, you know, in the seventies and eighties, when I was starting out, I mean, it's just not part of the the language um, or or in, the, in our sense of understanding uh, humanity uh, or ex- human experience. So I, I was really struggling. And the, the problem is that I was trying to write about the world while not really living in it. Um, and so uh, my first my first uh, published book was a collection of short stories called, this is a great title, Remind Me to Murder You Later, which was a, a phrase, of course, by Mo from the Three Stooges. And it was, that's a book of, of it's essentially grad school juvenilia, uh, some of those pieces in that collection of short stories uh, are very proud of how complex they are. That is not effortless prose, <laughs> to give it a good example. Um, after I published that collection of short stories, um, I, my first novel was a, a, a work called The Planets. And um, it was, I took the, the titles of the chapters from The Symphony by Holst and, um, and it was a collection of nine. Because it's of course a good thing I did it, you know, in the '90s, back when there were nine planets. Now there'd have to be eight, eight chapters rather than nine. Um, I'd have to completely get rid of Pluto. Anyway, um, boy, the '80s were so much easier oh. than the '90s. Well, you had an extra planet. You had an extra <laughs> planet, you know. And I think, you know, we we were all richer. We, well, we we discount the the loss that we've experienced with, with by losing a whole planet. Certainly, in terms of contemporary fiction. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, I, I published a, a few novels in the um, uh, '90s that the plants. Uh, it's a school uh, constellation, and then a, another comic novel called um, "Getting In," uh, one, two, three, um, and yet, um, I mean, and I think I'm really proud of those books. I love those books. I, I, I think they're. I mean, they're very entertaining. There's kind of a manic energy behind the voice, but there's something that's withheld, too. I think you, if you read between the lines now, you can see that the um, the author is trying to stay one step ahead of the um, 
the one thing I don't want to, I'm, I'm never vulnerable in those, in those books, which when I finally published my, my memoir, um, she's not there. Uh, I was in a big way because by then I'd come out as trans and, and the memoir was about the whole, um, uh, my experience with gender over the course of a lifetime. So she's not there was my first best-selling book, I think. Um, and it does represent, that's a real, I mean, I don't know, like I said before, you, you, you cross certain meridians, uh, in some ways there's the meridian of publishing your first, your first anything. For me, it was a short story I published in Florida review uh, called Fugue for Violin and Three Stooges. Then there's the, the meridian of your first published book. Then there's the meridian of your first book that's really from the heart. And I think if she's. I found something and she's not there that felt truer and tougher um, and more vulnerable than anything else I'd done. And I, I, I hope I've stayed with that voice. The only other thing I would say is that it was... Around 2007, 2008, I started writing op-eds for the New York Times, and um, it, it started off as kind of a lark, um, but as time has gone on, I mean, now, now I write a column there every other Wednesday for the op-ed page, and so in a, in a weird, circuitous route, here I am in my late 50s, kind of doing the thing that I dreamed of doing when I was columnist at the Wesleyan Argus <laughs> uh, back in 1979, um, writing, you know, an 800 word, uh, essay every two weeks on deadline. Um, and that's, that's also a really cool kind of writing and it's another kind of meridian to cross. So I don't know. Uh, the, the column that you write for the times, um, I would think that, uh, that's a great, um, well, one, you're getting to write for the times, you know, who, that, that's a an, an honor that a lot of uh, writers, you know, uh, could would really envy. Um, but the the type of writing you're doing there uh, is is that a great break? Uh, it lets you exercise some different muscles while you're in the midst of writing novels and memoir. Um, you know, is that a, a great way to shift gears creatively? It, it's it's it, it certainly is, and it's also a very different experience of writing. I mean, it takes for me it takes about five years, like a uh, long black veil. Uh, which um, is just about to come out in paperback, is a book that it took me about five years, more or less, to write between just the time thinking about it, the um, research I had to do, and then the many, 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 many drafts. Uh, that's, it takes me about five years, on average, to write a book with an, with, with an essay in the Times. Uh, you know, I, I usually I read it, I read it in a day. I revise it a couple times in the next day or two. Uh, it, it goes to the editor. It comes back from the editor. It, it'll go through six or seven drafts and then bang, it's on the uh, op-ed page of the bloody New York times where millions of people will see it. Uh, and so for a couple days uh, longer, if you're lucky, if you have a, if you have a piece that, that hits um, for a couple days, you're, you're a very well read writer. I mean, more people read an op-ed of mine, more people will read an op-ed of mine in the Times than will read any of my of my books, generally, uh, including the bestsellers. Uh, but that work, there's a way in which that work is ephemeral. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here talking, looking at a bookshelf full of the books that I've written, which with any luck will outlive me. Whereas a column in the Times, even though it, it will get more readers in a week than most of these books will in a lifetime, the column will also disappear. <laughs> so, it, you know, you're, it, I mean, I have to say it's, it's the, the best real estate in the world for a writer. You, you know, you open up the paper or you open up your device and there's, there's the thing you wrote in the bloody New York times. And it's really cool. And you walk around for a day or two, especially if, I mean, I had a piece a week or two ago um, called Inside of a Dog, which is about um, losing a dog of mine and adopting a new dog. And that, that piece was viral. It was, you know, it was number one on the, uh, on, the, um, on the trending list for a couple days. And 
you know, I felt like the most important writer in North America. Uh, and then, you know, slowly you fall off the list. And then a week later, you're back to being nobody again. <laughs> so it's a different place to be. Uh, you know, in, I mean, I don't know. I think in it, it, it's funny the way we think of ourselves with what we think our talent is and then what our talent actually turns out to be is maybe something that surprises us. I always wanted to be, you know, uh, a rock and roll star. <laughs> or and if I could be a rock and roll star, I would be a writer of, of, of really quirky short stories. Well, n- neither of those things turned out to be the case. But, it, but and to my surprise, I'm, a, I'm not a bad columnist. Um, so my, you know, my fallback plan has been much more successful than my, my primary ambition. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a bad thing. Um, you mentioned the uh, log black veil and we are going to dig into that in just a minute, but, um, you, you have written, uh, more than one memoir. Uh, she's not there, uh, also, uh, stuck in the middle with you. Um, and, uh, one thing I'm, I'm, I'm really intrigued by memoir, um, because uh, a lot of times when you're writing these stories, there are uh, uh, other people that uh, are involved in these stories that are still there. Um, it, is it a challenge writing memoir, uh, especially something that is so present uh, as uh, as the uh, as the stories you're telling in, in your memoirs? Um, is there something different about writing those than the fiction that you write? Obviously there is. Um, but how do you handle the reality of memoir and, and maybe the people around you that are also characters in the story, as opposed to the, uh, you know, the, the great quirky kind of comedies that you write? Well, the, the hardest thing about memoir is writing about people that you love and, um, you know, and not least the members of your family whom you have, taken a vow to protect and to love. I find it very hard. The more, the more love I have for someone, the more difficult it is to portray them in a story. So I think in some ways, my wife, whom I call Grace, and she's not there, but whose real name is Didi, I think Didi in some ways is the least successful character in my memoir. She's not there because I, I just couldn't write about her in any kind of abstract way. Um, and, um, I, am working on a, on a, on a book right now about, um, dogs and boyhood. And I have to talk about my best friend from childhood, uh, who is still one of my best friends, uh, whom I call zero in the book and writing about him has been very, very difficult. Um, the more, the more distant someone is, from your heart, the easier it is to characterize them. Whereas the, you know, the more you love someone, the more you understand all their many contradictions and contradictions are, are hard (laughs) to, to write about, um, on the page. So, uh, I, I have to say though, that on the whole, I've been pretty cavalier and heartless when it comes to trying to balance the, um, privacy of individuals versus my desire to tell the story. There's a Randy Newman song in which he, I think it's called, um, I miss you, which is, uh, a, a story. I'm sorry. A song he wrote for his ex-wife in which he's kind of admitting how much he, he really still loves his ex-wife. And, and you know, this is, this is while he's married to his second wife. Uh, and there's a line in there. I'm sorry. But, you know, I'd I'd sell my soul for a song and your soul, too. (laughs) I think it I think there's a way in which um, I'm kind of tyrannical about my desire to tell the story above all else. I know I've written things that have hurt people. Um, I know I've written stories that some people wish had not written I've included scenes. I included a scene and she's not there that my wife very specifically asked me not to tell. Um, and my feeling was like, ah, it's a great scene. But, <laughs> and um, it, all I can say is that, um, I mean, I mean, if I, if I really, really think I'm going to hurt somebody, sometimes a higher morality uh, 
intercedes. But a lot of the times I just have to say, look, our stories, our stories are not only ours. Sometimes the stories that happen to us belong not to us, but to others as well. But our stories do happen to us, and we can't constantly give away our stories simply because we're afraid of, of hurting people. Um, so we own our stories, and m- my feeling is I, I try to tell my stories with love, and all I can hope is that the people that leave in return will understand that this is just one of my personality faults and to be forgiven for it, and that there's ultimately a greater good that comes from... Um, from telling stories that will change the world with any luck will change the world, which certainly, certainly affect readers to say it more modestly. Um, and otherwise just, just to hope to be, to be forgiven. Um, it's not a, it's not a thing that I'm proud of, but it's also a thing I think I'm incapable of changing. Well, speaking of forgiveness, um, the uh, the the book uh, Long Black Veil, which is coming out in paperback uh, very soon, uh, is a is kind of a, a mystery thriller who done it. But um, and the more I, I talk to you, I completely understand where this book uh, is coming from because uh, there's a there's a real funny quirkiness about it that just really makes us unlike any book that I've I've gotten in quite some time. Um, But on the very first page, there's this little passage. I I just want to read it. Um, But over the years, I've come to believe that people are usually more deserving of forgiveness than judgment. This is not only because it's an act of grace. It's also because most men and women aren't afforded the luxury of dying more than once. Unlike some people I could mention. And uh, that that is such a great, such a great line. Um, And it really sets the tone for this book. Um, Yeah, I only had to write that paragraph about... 50 times i i, I completely literally, understand that literally oh, I, I know times. i know <laughs> I, I believe that i believe that with actually all my heart. and i i went to all of my writer because i was uh, my um usually the my first chapter comes last and usually the first paragraph of the first chapter comes is the last and i went to all of my writer friends including mary carr richard russo and timothy Kreider, with this paragraph because it just wouldn't swing and I kept saying, "You gotta help me." So everybody, everybody weighed in with with a different version of the first paragraph. Um, I'm, and I'm proud to say, in the end, I, I came up with something something different. Oh, I could I could provide the you know the the alternative, the you know in the uh, you know the director's cut. <laughs> I could provide the, the the 50 different first paragraphs that I had. But yeah, that business that we are. Um, I was trying to say that that. Um, more people are deserving of forgiveness than judgment. Uh, and I, I do like the idea of saying this is also true for people who have been afforded the luxury of dying more than once. Cause that's, that's a phrase where people are like dying more than once. Huh? So with any luck that will bring people into the story and make them think, make them want to know the answer to that. What, what does that mean? Dying more than once. It, and and what a brilliant uh, way to do that because I was sucked in. I was like, oh crap, what is what is what is she talking about? And I'm, I'm flipping pages, and the next thing I know, I'm halfway through the book. Um, so so what's the idea uh, behind this book? And uh, you said it, it, you know, you you work on a novel about five years. You did on this one, um, kind of. What is that that process of, of percolation of where the story grows and and you realize okay now i know what the story is i can begin well i had written th- three three memoirs um she's not there uh then the middle one uh i'm looking through you which is a memoir about growing up in a supposedly haunted house uh, and then that's uh, stuck with you uh, about parenthood and manhood and womanhood uh and i'd written those three the, the kind of gen- gender trilogy as i thought of it later and I thought, okay, I may have said everything I have to say about gender for a while. Uh, and so I was thinking about the next, what's the next project for me? And um, I, I realized I hadn't written a novel for grownups since, well, since getting in back in 1998. So uh, I've been thinking about writing a novel. And then uh, I'd heard about this place, Eastern Day Penitentiary. Uh, which is a real place, um, very near the heart of Philadelphia, in fact. Um, it's the oldest prison in the country. Uh, it was 
designed by Benjamin Franklin, but it stayed open until 1971. And uh, so... Um, it, it, it sits there in in the heart of Philadelphia, very near the art museum, um, as this kind of – when I was growing up, it was just this ruin that they didn't know what to do with. They couldn't tear it down, but they didn't know – I mean, what do you do with with a prison? Uh, there was talk of making it into sh- a shopping mall, which I think would have been interesting. Uh, but uh, uh, f- I, I'd always known about this place. It was it was considered one of the most haunted places in America. Um and there are like ghost ghost bus tours that you could go through there. So I, I I'd been there a couple times. I took a tour of it, and it was just a very it's a just the the scariest place I've ever been. If you imagine just a ruined 18th century prison, uh, uh, it crumbling into uh, disrepair, and yet with you can there, there's such a sense of something. Um, Historic and tragic happened in this place. Anyway, it's. I went one day when I was there. I went there with a friend of mine from high school, and I was thinking about friends from high school um, and the uh, the bonds that get formed then, and um, the way in which people get trapped, the prisons that we build for ourselves, and I somehow connected that with the idea of friends from high school, and I I thought about a group of. A, a story about a group of friends who get trapped inside the the ruins of this abandoned prison uh, when they're young, one day when they're young, and quickly find while they're trapped behind the prison that they're not alone and something bad happened. That struck me as a very promising beginning for a mystery. And it also struck me as a way of talking um, metaphorically about the, the prisons people themselves. And of this seven or eight friends, uh, from high school and college, um, all of them arrive in the delta of middle age, having never quite become themselves, um, having never quite become the people that they imagined becoming. Uh, and so each of them either made their peace or failed to make their peace with um, the prison's psychologically anyway, that they have found themselves in and um, have made their peace or failed to with the, with um, the hope of getting free. Uh, and it, I, I thought it would raise the question of what, what would, what would you do? You being the reader, what would you do in order to get your freedom in order to become yourself? It's, it should be no shock to anybody that one of the characters is trance but she's not the only one who has been, excuse me, who's been trapped and who's found her freedom. Um, everybody uh, is um, haunted uh, in middle age, in, in the book that is. Everyone is haunted by the ghost of the person they were when they were 20 uh, and uh, wonders even now whether or not they've let that person down or whether they're smarter than their 20 year old self and they just look back at that younger self with contempt as a person who didn't know how harsh the world was so it's funny we're having this conversation hank about um we we got here by talking about um our younger selves and who we wanted to be who i wanted to be when i when i was first setting out and my earliest memories of writing you know, when I was that young columnist, that young closeted person uh, at Wesleyan University who uh, was hoping to find her freedom by writing, by creating some fictional world, um, that's a person that, I, that I'm haunted by and that still looks over my shoulder. And I still wonder if I'm living up to – because, you know, 20-year-olds are very um, – tyrannical they have such high expectations for who their old selves are going to be and you know i think one of the one of the blessings of middle age is that you you look back if you're lucky you can look back at your younger self and say you know um so you didn't become john lennon but you became something better which was yourself and that should be um that that's that's a good consolation <laughs> 
and hopefully some peace comes with age and, and you, you start to make uh, friends with, with, with yourself and, and who you couldn't in your 20s. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, 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 it, it becomes hard to remember sometimes who that younger self was. Um, uh, so one of the, one of the things I liked about writing Long Black Veil is trying to remember that frame of mind. So the book begins, begins on a hot summer day in, um, 1980 with a group of people who have recently graduated from, drum roll please, Wesleyan University. Uh, and they get themselves into this mess, um, getting accidentally locked into this um, abandoned prison, something bad happens. Um, but then most, then we flash forward, and most of the book takes place in the present, where we meet the same group of people who are now um, uh, in middle age and are parents uh, or lovers or ex-lovers, and um, uh, they are involved with the same business. Um, it, so it's it, it, of of trying to negotiate between the past and the future and also trying to trying to i mean one to figure out who who done it the, the thing the thing that happened uh and um also in, in a way in a way who done it is less important than, i mean it's it, it, who actually is responsible for the murder that takes place in chapter one in some ways it's a macguffin as alfred hitchcock would call it um because the story is less really it's really, it's less concerned with unraveling that mystery than with unraveling the mystery of who these people are and how they became themselves um, and who they'll be in the future. So it's more of a, it's less of a whodunit than a who is it. <laughs> right. And, well, it's, it's a great uh, exploration of character. And, um, you know, if, if you're of the camp that believes that character is plot, um, the, the plot that the, that the reader thinks they're being introduced uh, to is not actually the plot. The plot is the characters and how they're, dealing with uh with what's going on which is uh which is perfect well actually the another big breakthrough in that novel the moment that i realized i was going to be able to finish this novel was when i suddenly realized that i didn't have to hold the answer to who did who done it to to the denouement i didn't have to wait until the final chapter what i realized is that i could reach a certain point where so there's a certain point in in the book where and it's about is it maybe it's not even quite the halfway point. It might even be before the halfway point where there are two characters who are off together and one says to the other at the end of the chapter, you know, I think they're onto us. <laughs> so at the end of that chapter, again, it's like the, it's the, around the halfway point. Now you know who done it. And, and so there's, I hope it's kind of a cool moment for the reader where you realize, well, so that mystery has been solved, but, um, what, what, but what else you got and what will be the ramifications of, um, when the other characters find out this truth. So that, that was, um, you know, that, that, that line in Casablanca around up the usual suspects. There's a great, there's a great story of how, when the writers came up with that line, they knew they had it where, and for me, it was when I, when I realized, you know, they're onto us. <laughs> When I realized that I could simply flip that card early in the book, um, suddenly I thought, oh, okay. So maybe I do know how to write a mystery. Right. And then the, the reader's like, uh, I know who done it, but there are still pages. Right. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I love it. Um, Jennifer, uh, the, the book is Long Black Veil, coming out uh, very soon in paperback. We're going to send everybody to pick up a copy of it. Um, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. If, if people are not familiar with your work, where can they find you online? Well, certainly look for me at jenniferboylan.net. Uh, and uh, you can find me in the New York Times every other Wednesday and sometimes uh, in between. Uh, so... Uh, the Times has a, a page with all my collected short work uh, there. So if you go to the New York Times site and um, search for Jennifer Boylan, you'll find me there as well. My Twitter handle is Jenny Boylan. Uh, I think that's everything. 
<laughs> Excellent. Uh, we're going to send everybody to uh, to see you. And uh, Jennifer, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank today. you so much, Hank. This was a gas. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. I was ten years old when I saw my first ghost. The year was 1770. My father was a barber. He kept a small shop at the Kuenhoven Inn, where the King's Road met the Old Loop. Our modest home lay to the north, between the inn and the hanging tree. A simple box of pine boards, whitewashed with crushed oyster shell, one room with a spinning wheel for mother, a chair for father, and up a ladder of branches, a garret where my parents slept. I slept on the floor below, alongside my little brother, Hans, five years younger than I. Our floor sloped toward the Hudson, so that when Hans rolled over in his sleep, he often went on rolling and couldn't stop, collecting splinters and grievances. Yet on this particular night, he slept peacefully, and I was the fitful one. A mouse had taken shelter in our wall, fleeing the October chill. It scritched and scratched, nibbling a nest for itself. The sound thrilled me. I possessed a vivid mind, full of toadstools and bullfrogs and lightning storms, and so imagined a skeleton writhed in the wood. The bones of Anne Underhill, perhaps, murdered by Indians at Spook Rock. I'd heard that tale from my father, who reveled in the Dutch superstitions. He would gather us to fireside on winter nights and spin tales of the Heer of Dunderberg, that storm king who rattled our white windows, of the Lady of Raven Rock who died in snowfall, pining for her lover, of trolls beneath the penny bridge and hobgoblins in the hanging tree. He'd filled my head with such dark romance that I lay waiting for Anne's little finger bones to drag me off to some bloody fate. I rather hoped she would. A cloud cleared the moon, and a square of light fell on my mother's spinning wheel. The sharp spindle glinted, and the wheel began to turn, without touch. A figure appeared before me, as through a mist. A gray head bent to the work. She fixed me with eyes black as open graves and whispered in a low, guttural hiss, Spin, or you shall not eat. I cried out and fell to my pallet, arms over my head. Hans awoke, lost his balance, and rolled away, bleeding with pain as he struck the riverside wall. Father emerged above. Agatha, what is wrong? There's a ghost, Papa. A ghost, help me. Hans laughed despite his bruises, and Mother moaned and ordered us to sleep. But Papa descended and took my hands, his blue eyes twinkling. What did you see? An old woman. She said, spin or you shall not eat. Oh, he raised a candle beneath his chin. You saw old Willow. She lived here long ago, when this was the home of Isaac Hart, our candle maker. Her husband was killed by savages. Hart took her in at the request of Lord Phillips, who paid a token sum for her upkeep. But Hart was greedy and kept the money for himself. He never fed her unless she spun. So Willow spun and spun and spun like a spider, year by year, growing old and blind and falling to waste. She died at that spinning wheel, fell over one day, and the spindle pierced her heart. Hans screamed and hid beneath the table. Mother appeared above. Daniel Van Ripper, you are a fool! I kissed Papa's fingers, for I loathed that spinning wheel. I'd be no toothless ghost, spinning and haunting little girls. I felt pity for such a spirit and gratitude to have her example before me, stealing my resolve. Every night thereafter, I would leave a crust of bread for old Willow and sleep with one eye open in case she came to spin for me again. 